Let's pray together. And what words, Lord. In winter, I will believe you. In springtime, I'll see you. It's just so mindful for me this morning that there are those in this room that are in seasons of winter and they're waiting for spring. Some in this morning, in this room that are in the middle of the night and they're waiting for the sun to rise. There are some in this room that are just waiting. And all of us in some aspect of the word are waiting for something in our lives to occur. And so would you come and teach us, Lord, this morning how to wait well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So glad to have John Hull with us here. If, if you've ever been on a mission trip with John Hull, it's life-changing. John Hull carries just such a humility with him here in the church, but when you take him on a plane and go overseas, his ability to represent this church, his ability to disciple people, his ability to walk people through experiences that they're experiencing is incredible. And I got to do that three years ago with John, and we went to Kenya, and we went alongside Zoe International, what Mark and Nikki just came back from, and it was an amazing experience. Now, here's the funny part. At the end of our trip, John decided we would take a day and go to a safari, and so I said, that'd be really fun. So we got in a small plane, and we took off, and we landed on an airstrip in the middle of the Masai Mara, in the middle of nowhere. You see animals all around you. You get in this little Jeep, and you begin to drive to your little village where you're living, which is basically kind of this wooden wall you drive through. And apparently the week before we got there, the offices, no joke, I thought they were messing with me. Apparently the week before we got there, the offices there had been overrun by a lion's den. But they had just gotten them out, so everything's fine. We can register you now. And what they do is they show you this sort of wooden platform that you're going to sleep in overnight. Now, trust me, it's a nice platform, but it is still a wooden platform. And this wooden platform overlooks this beautiful river, and in the river are these hippos. Now, for those of you who don't know, I think they're cute. Apparently, hippos are the most dangerous creatures in Africa, and we are sleeping at a tent right outside the river with hippos. John says, don't worry about it. They have guards that will protect us during the night with guns. Everything will be fine, sleep well. And so I'm realizing I got to get to bed because I've got a day where I get to watch other animals possibly eat other animals. So we go to bed pretty early and I'm laying there in bed in Kenya in the middle of the Masai Mara thinking to myself, there is zero chance I'm going to be able to go to sleep tonight. But I just begin to close my eyes. I'm just going, God, you're going to have to put me to sleep tonight. I cannot wait all night long for the sun to rise so I just try to doze off. I'm just like dozing off. Don't think about just the tent canvas that's protecting you from all these wild animals all around. Just close your eyes. Trust me, the guard outside has got it all under control. Just go to sleep. Well, about 30 minutes into trying to fall asleep, I start to hear a very loud snoring sound. And I'm thinking, no, this can't possibly, I'm already worried about the wild animals. There's no way I'm going to be able to go to sleep during the snoring, so I'm going to put an end to this. So I went to the first person in my little tent who was laying there, and I thought it was them. So I went over, and I listened, and it wasn't them. I tried to push him over. It wasn't them. Okay. Then I thought, it's definitely John Hull. He's got to be the one snoring on the other end of the cabin. So we walked to the other end of the tent, and I listened in, and John Hull is completely asleep, quiet. There is snoring occurring. Now, here's the deal. There's only three of us in the tent, and it's not me, and it's not them two. So I'm thinking, there's someone snoring in this tent. Well, then my worst nightmares begin to play. Scenarios begin to play in my mind. The guard who's supposed to be protecting us from the hippos is snoring at the tent. I, we're dead. And then I thought, okay, wait, no. If he stops snoring and I hear screaming, then we're dead. So I was trying to play all these scenarios in my mind. It's late into the night, and I just finally, at some point, there's just this noise. That's, it's almost as if it's coming out of my bed, and I'm just thinking, this is the weirdest thing in the world. I've got to ask someone in the morning. So sure enough, I got such little sleep and I woke up, we had breakfast and I went to the guard and in broken English, I was like, I got to figure out what that noise was so I can sleep tonight. So I go up to the guard and I say, did you hear, I was hoping I wouldn't embarrass him if it was him. I said, did you hear snoring last night? And he chuckles. He just starts laughing. He goes, oh, underneath your bed is a warthog. Where I was laying underneath me by two feet, a warthog had slept all night long and was snoring horribly. It was one of the longest nights of my life. It wasn't John Hole, it was Pumbaa right there. <laughs> Smelly old Pumbaa. The Lion King come to life. We wait. 
Now, not just at night. A lot of us in the room, we stay up late at night. We go on a business trip. We can't sleep. We're anxious about the next day. We can't sleep. We've got something going on. And so we struggle to sleep. So we wait, not well, but we wait throughout the night. But the truth is all of us, in some sense, are waiting throughout the night. All of us, in some sense, are waiting for the sun to rise at, with something in our lives. Raise your hand if you've already gone on vacation this summer. Come on. Those that have been on vacation, that's a lot of the room. All right, who hasn't gone on vacation yet but is about to go on vacation by the end of the summer? Okay, so it's about 70, 30. There's research that was done in 2010 by the Applied Research and Quality of Life. And what they did was they wanted to measure happiness in regards to vacationing. Now, as you would expect, happiness hits sort of boost up during the vacation. And then on the final two days, the final day of vacation, when you realize you've got to go back to reality, happiness takes a nosedive. But what was fascinating about the research is this, the happiness level is at an all-time high before you ever go on the trip. They found that those that are happiest are happiest the days before you leave on your trip. That's why researchers say don't take a two-week trip only. Take trips all throughout the year because the days before your trip are actually when you're the happiness. It's the waiting. It's the anticipation of a break. It's the anticipation of the beach. It's the anticipation of the mountain. It's the anticip anticipation of not having to work. It is that which that waiting. And waiting like that occurs all the time. Maybe it's your uh, wedding day coming up soon. Maybe it's your birthday coming up soon. Maybe it's a new job promotion that you're looking forward to. Waiting with excitement and anticipation is a part of all of our lives. But the truth is most of us wait. And when we're waiting for something to occur in our life, waiting for that outcome, it's actually really difficult. Now, Culture has figured this completely out, by the way. I mean, folks, there are three lanes at Chick-fil-A now in Alden Bridge. <laughs> not one, not two, there are three. It's incredible. You can get a French fry in five seconds. It's amazing. <laughs> but what culture has learned is if I can get you Netflix and Hulu like that, if I can get you a package tomorrow, if I can give you your groceries by this afternoon, if I don't have to make you wait, then you'll buy products more and more. Culture has learned that we as a people hate to wait. We hate to wait. The, the ability to gain any type of information we want on our phones like that, we don't have to wait anymore. We don't have to go to the library and look it up. We get what we want now and quickly. Here's the problem. If you've been alive more than a couple of days, you realize that God doesn't work with that timetable. He's not interested in you getting what you want now, fast, quickly. In fact, the Bible is filled with characters that did not get to wait. It was Abraham who received the promise from God that he would be the father of many nations at the age of 75. But he did not have Isaac until he was 100. He waited 25 years for the promise of God for his life. It was Joseph who waited 13 years enslaved in prison. He had had the dream that he would be in command, but it was 13 years in prison where Joseph waited for the promises of God in his life. It seems to me that God wasn't interested in giving us and giving them what they wanted quickly. You know the story of Moses and the Israelites wandering through the desert? They wandered 40 years through the desert. Why? Jesus himself. You know, here is, here is God, Emmanuel, with flesh on. And yet he waits 30 years before he begins his ministry. God was... God was working. See, what we have to realize is that God does not work according to our timetables. In fact, it seems that God, when we're waiting, he's working. That there's a purpose behind your waiting. Now, this isn't always easy. I mean, some of us, waiting isn't difficult, it's painful. Those in the room that are single, that are looking for someone to spend the rest of their life with, and you've been waiting. For those in this room that have been trying to have a baby as a married couple and you've just been waiting to get pregnant, and this hasn't been days, it hasn't been weeks, it hasn't been months, some of you, it's been years. 
brokenness in relationships, emotional wounds that you carry in your marriage or in your friendships or with your mom or your dad or your friends. These things don't heal like that. There are seasons of long waiting. Some of you wrestling with sicknesses like cancer and you just are waiting and you are just going, I'm in the middle of the darkest of night waiting for the sunset, waiting for the sunrise, sorry. I'm just waiting for the sun to rise over the horizon. And so for you, when I'm talking about waiting, you're going, listen, this is not easy. But think about it for a second. Isn't life basically a season Seasons after seasons of waiting. When you're a kid, you can't wait to get older. When you're in high school, you can't wait to get to college. When you're in college, you can't wait to get a job. When you get a job, you can't wait to get married. When you're married, you can't wait to have your first house. When you have your first house in your starter home, you're like, can't wait to get out of your starter home and get your dream home. When you get your dream home, you can't wait to make enough money to pay for all these vacations I was just talking about. <laughs> when you finally get to go on vacations, you decide vacationing is awesome. I want to do this permanently. And you can't wait for the day that you get to retire. And then the day you get to retire, you realize that most of us spend our entire life waiting for what's next instead of living for what's now. Most of us wait hoping that that next outcome, that waiting thing you're waiting for will somehow unlock happiness that you've been longing for when the reality is maybe you're waiting because God has purpose in your waiting. Maybe there's something he's wanting to do on the inside of you in this season of waiting. And that's not easy, especially when waiting is painful. So what is it? Before we keep going, identify that place in your life because I'm not talking to a handful of people. I'm talking to everybody in the room. All of you are waiting for something. So God, would you just highlight for everyone in the room that places where they're waiting? What is that thing they're waiting for? And God, would you teach us this morning not to ask the question, are we gonna wait and when will we wait? But how do we wait in this moment well? How do we wait in this moment well? Let's start here. Heaven has a vantage point. God sees what you and I cannot see. To God, waiting is not wasting. It's not a season passively sitting back and doing nothing for a period of time. I mean, you know the scripture. You've heard it all your life, Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a... Heaven has a vantage point of your life. God has this ability to see things in your life that you cannot see. God sees you. And scripture's promise to us is that he has good plans for our life, plans to give us hope and a future. That's God's vantage point. So what is God doing in these seasons of waiting? Now really, what is God doing in these seasons of waiting? Could it be that he's preparing you? Could this season of waiting be him preparing you? We're celebrating, uh, I can't believe it, when we had our first kiddo, Lauren, it's, she'll turn 13 in December, and Caleb, my son, who's here, his birthday's today. He turns 10 years old today, which is pretty awesome. But for those of you that have kids, you recognize that the nine months that you're waiting for your kid to be born is, are incredible. And you cannot wait for the day. And you'll start to put together calendars. You'll begin to put together dates. You'll begin to put together weeks. And before you know it, you're checking off, you're checking off, and you realize they come. And then the baby comes. And then all of a sudden you look at your doctor and you go, wait, you're leaving me alone with this kid. And then the doctor says, I'm not leaving you alone. I want you to get out of the hospital. Get out of here. Go home. And you go, I'm supposed to take this thing with me and get out of here? They say, absolutely. And what you recognize is that, I mean, what I've recognized in those nine months is that not only was God forming a baby, God was forming a father. God was preparing my heart, my wife's heart, your heart. See, that's what waiting often is, is though we cannot wait for the outcome, God can't wait for the now. He can't for the wait for the preparation he gets to do in you right now. You're waiting for the husband God's wanting to form and work in you right now. You're waiting for that job? God's going, no, can I please teach you some leadership skills right now? Can you trust me right now? Can you lean into me right now? Because if heaven has a vantage point, 
then doesn't God see where we're headed? And doesn't God want to provide like any good father would? Doesn't God want to provide and prepare you for what's coming next? Could it be preparation? Could it be the maturing, the maturation of your faith? Could it be during these seasons that God's inviting you to lean in and trust him? Could it be during these seasons of waiting that God's wanting you to grow in your intimacy and dependency upon him? We just sang the song. We just sang it just a moment ago. Slow down, take time, breathe in, he said. So take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. Perhaps this season for you is not just a preparation, but God is inviting you to trust him. He's inviting you to grow, not just you, but your faith, to lean into him and to trust him. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. I am sure that God keeps no one waiting unless he sees that it is good for him to wait. C.S. Lewis believed that if God is having you wait, he sees that it's good, that there's a purpose to it, that there's a reason that God's having you wait. And this is really hard when we're talking about hard things. But leaning in and trusting him, even though you don't know the outcome, leaning in. Now, why is this so hard? It's so hard. In fact, it's the most difficult thing to do because most of the time what we think is if we can grab a hold of the outcome, if we can make whatever we want to happen to happen our own self, if we are in charge of our own destiny, if we are to take control, then we grab and we clench with all of our might whatever we want the outcome to be, whatever we're waiting for. We go, we're not going to wait. We're going to grab a hold of this. We're going to make this happen. I'm going to make decisions based upon this happening. And what we find is that fear and anxiety doesn't drop when you clinch. Actually, fear and anxiety shoots to the roof. You've experienced this in seasons of waiting. Think about it. When you try to create your own outcome, when you try to make something come quicker, fear and anxiety didn't just arise in you. It arose in all of your people that surround you. They recognize that something's off with you. You're trying to make something happen for us or for you, and you can't do it. There are some things in life you cannot do. So hear this truth. When we wait poorly, when we wait poorly, we grow weaker. But when we wait on him, we grow stronger. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31 says this. Isaiah writes, Have you not known, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God? the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow faint. He doesn't grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. I love this. We got a lot of young people in here today. Even young people, youth will faint and grow weary and the young will fall exhausted. But hear this truth. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up With wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow strength. Isaiah says, God is the eternal, sovereign creator of the universe in a world where everybody grows tired, in a world where everybody grows weary. He has a vantage point. And so what's his direction? What's the truth for us as believers to do? He says, if you want to wait and control it yourself, you will grow weaker. But if you wait upon God, you will have your strength renewed. That's the promises of God. It goes against everything on the inside of us. See, what we do when we're tired of waiting is we busy ourselves. We distract ourselves. We put anything in our lives hoping that if we can distract ourselves long enough, one at some point will get what we want. But the truth is, that is not the way that God's called us to live. He says in seasons of waiting, when you're waiting for something, you are called to wait upon God. To wait poorly is to distract yourself. To wait with renewing strength is to wait on God. And so how do we do that? And why is it so difficult? Warren Wiersbe wrote this. The ability to calm your soul and wait before God is one of the most difficult things in the Christian life. Our old nature is restless. The world around us is frantically in a hurry, but a restless heart usually leads to a reckless life. Okay, so then what is waiting on God? Could it simply be 
Could it simply be just waiting before God? Now, I've been looking at the scripture this week, and in seasons that I'm waiting, I tried this. Let me tell you what happened. The moment that you wait upon God, every fear and anxiety that's been existing in you seems to surface in the stillness of the moment. Every scenario that you've planned in your life of what will happen if you don't get what you want begins to play in your mind before God. It's as if everything that you've been trying to bury comes to life. And so I'm going, God, I don't really like this scripture. What are you doing in the midst of this? And then in that moment, when everything comes to the surface, everything you've been wrestling with, everything that you want God to do in your life, everything that you want God to help you with, you then go before the God who created you, as Isaiah said, the sovereign, eternal God of the universe, who has a vantage point over your life, and you say, God, in this moment, I need you to come. And I'm telling you, I've just, I've experienced it this week. There's this sort of inner peace that shows up. It's as if God is combating, fighting against those things in our life in those types of moments. Exodus 14, 4 says that God will fight for you. You only have to be still. That doesn't seem like the way I want to live my life. If I want something done, why don't I do it? Why don't I take control of my life? Why don't I hustle and get it done? Why am I not the success? How can I not create the success? Everything in me, even in ministry, wants to do that, to control my own outcome. Yet God says, (laughs) you want me to fight for you? Okay, be still. It goes against everything on the inside of us. Warren is right. It's the hardest thing for us Christians to do is to be still before God. Yet the Psalms repeatedly. Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord. David says, my soul waits for in his word I hope. So is it simply that? Is it simply waiting before God? Is it simply coming before God, allowing all these things like a volcano to erupt out of us that we might sort of let God move in and combat these things in our lives? Yes, but what happens when those voices begin to speak louder than our ability to stay? What happens when we come before God and it's too much for us so we jump back into the world because whatever I just talked about is not happening in my life. What is God inviting us to? Well, the psalm I just read gives us the answer. Yes, my soul waits for God, but in his word, I hope. In his promises, I hope. It's as if God is saying, don't clench on to your life and its results, but clench on to the promises I placed in Scripture. There are three Scriptures I'm going to throw on the screen here, and I want to read them for you. And I just grabbed them from the Bible. I said, God, what are the Scriptures that we as harvesters need to cling to? So if you want to write these down, or you want to grab your phone and take a picture, or right after the service, we'll have it on social media. You can have it there, but these are important. These are promises of God we find in Scripture, Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I, God, am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Psalm 23.4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I don't think I ever realized this. It's that when we are still before God and when fear and anxiety begins to rise in us, when we hear the voices in our head more than the voice of heaven, then what we as believers are supposed to do is, and David just said it in the psalm, is to put our hope in the word. So that when we struggle with fear in our lives because of something coming up, we go, no, Isaiah 41.10 says, I'm not to fear for God's with me. That when we are scared about a future situation, we go, no, Deuteronomy 31 says, the Lord himself goes before me. 
that there's nothing for me to be afraid of. It's as if God is going. When fear arises, combat it with the promises of God. Combat it with the truth of God. See, this is why the scriptures are so important for us as the people of God. Because not if the voices speak to us, when the voices, the false voices and the scenarios begin to happen in our life, we are supposed to be as believers to go, no, even though through I walk through this darkest valley, my God is with me. He's with me. See, we're supposed to speak truth, not just wait upon God, but to hold his word in our hand and to speak the truth against the false voices that we hear. Waiting builds dependency and intimacy with God. See, you're waiting on something. Maybe you're anticipating. Maybe you're anxiously fearful. Maybe for you, what you've been waiting on has been days or years. Maybe you have seen yourself grown bitter, frustrated, distant from God because this has not come about yet. Your hands are not open, they're clenched. You still to this day are trying to control the outcome. You have not surrendered yet. The prayer and the Lord's prayer is Give me today my daily bread. Not God, in this moment, give me a loaf for all of life. It's today. Give me a promise that I can hold on to. And it's almost if the word of God is supposed to be for us the anchor of the soul. That the promises of God in our lives are the anchor no matter what life's Looking like God is the anchor of the soul. So take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast on his word, my soul. For he is in the waiting. He's not gone. He's here in the waiting. Would you close your eyes with me? I just, I want you to once again just ask God, God, what are those places in my life where I'm waiting? What season of waiting am I in? And then I want you to ask the question, is my fist clenched around the outcome of this or have I surrendered this to you? For some in this room, that is unbelievably difficult to imagine releasing. And if you sense that God's saying, no, you are, have your fist clenched around this, then just in your heart, would you say, God, would you give me the strength to unleash, to unclench my fist to trust you with whatever this is that I'm waiting for, whether it be a job, a relationship, healing, a kid, a child, a mom, a dad. God, teach us this week to wait on you. Teach us this week to find times throughout this week where we come before you and we wait on you. And yes, when fear and anxiety arise, when those scenarios begin to play in our head because of the stillness of that moment, oh God, may we have the word of God ready to speak truth into those places where we've been lied to. Help us, oh God, to see you, to trust you, and that this season of waiting might grow us closer to your heart more dependent on you, leaning in and trusting you all the while. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.